Come on, how many know that God goes before us in every one of our battles? And all we need to do is give him praise and honor. So can we give God some praise right now? The praise that he deserves. He's a worthy God. Well, welcome, welcome everyone to session number three of Marriage Challenge. Today we're going to begin session three and we're going to hear from Gavin and Ashley Tate. Can we give them a round of applause as they're here? And we're going to start off with a few questions in the house. So you guys may take your seat and uh, let's jump right in and get started. Hello, Gavin. Hello, Ashley. Well, we are so excited for you guys to join us today. And, you know, we are in Marriage Challenge and it has been so life changing and transforming. But I want to mention this, the book really quick. Um, this workbook that, that we have is more than just like a supplementary thing in Marriage Challenge. This workbook has so many tools and resources for us to grow and get equipped. You know, I was just talking earlier about how week one we talked about commitment, week two we talked about forgiveness, and yes. today we're gonna talk about communication, but yes. there's really not enough time in one service to really get deep and talk about a lot of them. We have 30, 45 minutes to talk about a subject, but you could be in it for weeks or every day, but that's what this book is for. Today we're not gonna get everything about communication, but throughout the week, every single day in our workbooks, we can go deeper and deeper and get another layer and another layer and really help us every day to really capture it and help our marriages to go to the next level. But not just that, not only will your marriage go to the next level, but, but really mastering this will help you to help somebody else. Come on, because we know other people that can benefit from this packet. Some will say, well, well, we know somebody that can benefit from the resources and the tools we're learning. Become a master in this and you can help somebody anywhere. And if you're saying, man, I, I haven't really been doing my homework. I haven't really been engaged in it. It's not too late to start now. We can begin today because remember, marriage isn't confined to a four week seminar. Marriage is a lifetime commitment. It's a lifetime growth process. So you can begin this at any time. Keep this with you. There's tools and resources and date nights and scriptures yes. and declarations, date all nights. sorts of things in here to help you grow and go to the next level. So and we only have a few left, right? Right. Only 40? Was yeah, it 40? That, that's of this morning. As of this morning, so, so there's I, probably less. Yeah, there could be less now, but there's 60 out there that were purchased that haven't been claimed yet though. So if you're one of those, you bought it, Go get it. <laughs> it's sitting there waiting for you. So we have some left, so I want to encourage you guys. But we're going to hear from Gavin and Ashley right now, and we want to get to know you guys just a little bit. So sure. how long have you guys been married? It'll be 10 years in July. Wow. Decade, decade. Congratulations, 10 years. And we got just one uh, quick question for you guys. Yes, what's one thing that you love about your spouse? Well, I share this in first service too, but I love, when I was getting to know Gavin, I just always knew he was different. Like I was in a Christian community and so I was, um, you know, just kind of like journeying through life with other people that were pursuing God and, and um, living life for God. But there was always, I just felt like Gavin and as I observed him, I knew he had more of a pursuit like he was just completely sold out to the lord and completely committed and one thing that i always would pray about my future spouse when i was in my single time was i want somebody i want a man that loves god with all of his heart soul mind and strength and really cherishes loves his neighbor as himself and i knew that that was this man so that's what I'm most grateful for. Awesome. Yeah, so I asked my, uh, my dad, who's like my spiritual mentor uh, my entire life and always somebody I could go to. I asked him when I was dating Ashley, said, you know, what do you think? And he said, well, all I can say about Ashley is one word. She's quality. And I said, that's exactly it. She's totally quality. She's quality in her presentation. She's quality with that she honors authority. She's quality in the fact she already had businesses going. She was making money already. She didn't like depend on a man to do any of that, which is very attractive to me. 
um, that she was already very independent with all that stuff. Um, and honestly, uh, she was raised under a very, very strong biblical uh, value system, obviously in her own house. But her, both of her parents are very, very strong on that. But she was also raised under John and Lisa Bevere for about seven years, traveling with Lisa around everywhere. So really had a strong biblical foundation of that. And, uh, you know, and she loved to dance. And that's how we actually met. We met salsa dancing because I was a competitive ballroom dancer for a couple of years in Colorado Springs. And so I was taking some people out to dance uh, singles into a safe environment that wasn't like a club or something where people were going to be grinding and all that. Just a safe environment. So I knew all the dance studios around town. And, you know, so I take 20, 30 odd singles and I go teach them, you know, the basics of salsa, the tango, the waltz or whatever. And she had a partner that she was dancing the tango with that kind of dropped out. And so she came to get some from me. And, and so we danced the first time and she asked me, she's like, can I get some private lessons? And I'm like, well, geez. <laughs> I'm like a man that loves God and likes to dance. Yeah, yeah. And I was wearing these dragon pants. They were competitive ballroom pants. So there was dragon going on the side. At that point, I wasn't realizing. Picture, actually. I wasn't realizing. Oh, wait, no, no picture. No, no. Just I wasn't. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I wasn't realizing that, you know, there were demonic symbols and everything all over my pants. But at the time, you know, they were really cool. They were hot fire red. And yes. she fell in love with my, my body, basically, <laughs> before oh, my oh, spirit. Oh, so just so you know. It, it, some, you can come in any way you can. You know, lust is now turned into glory. Praise God. Lord, help us. That's why we're here today, somebody. Come on. <laughs> so we have some uh, questions from the audience. And these are live questions that we have not reviewed with Gavin and Ashley. So these are going to be real questions. So we got Pastor Armando over here. Awesome. So, Good morning, everybody. One. I'm with Heather and Michael. They've been married 23 years. Let's give them a hand for that. Come on, Heather and Michael. They got three beautiful daughters and one son. Heather, what's your question for Pastor Gavin and Ashley today? Um, I just want to know, after being married for 23 years, we didn't start out our marriage in Christ. Like, we're, we're now serving God together, but we have our older kids who are now have this pushback because they've been... They knew us before we knew Jesus. So now there's this pushback, like how do we stand um, unified together when there's always like that push? Like we want them to be saved, but they just keep remembering the old, not the new. Mm, great question. Yeah, so there was a similar question that was in the first service about a blended family, and they had older kids now that aren't saved as well. And so I'll just give you very similar to the answer that I give them, which is the most common thing I see when people have gotten married before Jesus and then later on they get saved together. Obviously, it's a beautiful thing. But like you said, sometimes your families were privy to seeing you completely, you know, full of the devil, you know, and, and just not serving God in any way. And so as much as everybody else in the church buys and it's like, oh, we're so grateful and so happy for you for your testimony, your family doesn't buy it. They don't exactly just believe it because it's happened. Um, and so really, the thing that is irresistible for unsaved family members is consistency of you and God. And, and what I mean is, there is an eventual, imagine every time that you are consistent with God's house and you prioritize it, there's an eventual, they are watching and there's an eventual chipping away at a hard heart. Every time that you are deciding when you guys have disagreements as a married couple, not to deal with it as people in the world will deal with it, but going to God and the Holy Spirit and saying, you know what, it's not about being right, it's about unity, it's about something God could command a blessing on. Every time they come over to your house and you prioritize peace and the things you watch and the things you do, you are being consistent. No no matter what they say or don't believe, because many people don't understand that the loudest sermon you preach to your own family is not actually preaching. The loudest sermon you preach to them is that you're full of joy and not depression anymore. You're consistently having a grounded peace and you're not in this, you're not fighting the same thing they're seeing because honestly, what would they want from you if you live exactly like they do? So really consistency, and that's where you got to trust God. You got to say, Lord, we're, being, we're going to be on fire for you. We're going to be praying. We're going to be doing the things we know we're supposed to do. We're going to be in the Bible. If they come into this house, and you also have to say that when you're in our house, there are standards that we have, and you can't be afraid of saying that. You can't, they can't just do whatever they want in your house. They can't watch whatever they want. It's not a rejection. It is once again being consistent. You are different now, and you're going to be consistent to the standard God's given you. When you do that, you are preaching the loudest sermon you can preach, and you trust God with the timing now for your family members, but that's what I would give you. Be consistent with Jesus. Get breakthroughs. Be happy. 
Great, great question. Thank you so much. We have another question with uh, Ruben right over here. Yes, we're with Sophia. Sophia de la Cruz. Oh, I love Sophia de la Cruz. I know her. Yes, we've been together recently. We've been coming since December. So we got married in January. We're going to do the massive wedding after the marriage challenge. So our question was basically the same thing, like a blended family. You know, he has his kids. I have my kids. They're older. So our question is, we're new, we're fresh. So what would you suggest as a beginning? You know, it's, it's really, it's been a bumpy challenge. Yeah. Like what is advice for this beginning of this marriage? Well, the beginnings are also foundations. And what would you say about that, babe? I was going to say just practically, are you doing the growth cha- the daily growth challenge book together as a family as much as you can? I think that that's really important just in creating a culture of, okay, now this is how we're creating our family together and sitting down and literally getting to hear from everyone. I don't know if they're grown and um, do they live in the home? No, nobody lives. It's just me and him. And okay. it's been a challenge because... I speak English, he speaks Spanish. Mm-hmm. So that's like, that's why communication is like really highlighted today. Wow. And we're paying close attention. So that's a problem of communication. And the kids are not in the home, yeah. but my kids come around. And maybe it could be bumpy, you right. know. Um, he doesn't understand them, they're not saved. And, and I'm striving to bring them to the Lord. I'm striving. Mm-hmm. And make sure you're striving the right way. Don't be wasting your energy. The Bible says that when you strive outside of the spirit, you strive against God's plan. So you got to be striving the right way. Don't be working outside of how the Holy Spirit is wanting you to work because you're working against God when you do that. So when you strive in God, when you're striving in the spirit, the Bible says you can actually strive in the spirit. It means you're striving under his direction. You're striving, listening closely to what he's saying. You're being, you know when to be quiet. You know when to say something. You know when to preach, when not to preach. Just when you're striving that way, all of your efforts are going toward planting the right seeds for the right harvest. So um, I would just say that, remember to the beginning for you guys, the beginnings are foundations. And the habits that you guys really strive, another word, or work to create, because you have to be intentional. These are the habits of praying before you go to sleep together, praying together, not just alone. These are the habits of opening the Bible. The daily growth book was what she said in your house so that, you know, it's not something you kind of do on your own and he does on his own. These are habits you do together. Do you guys have times you can just speak? Are you learning? Like you said, you speak English, he speaks Spanish. There's going to be a lot of time you're going to need to learn how to communicate what he does. And when he says his word this way, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I, oh, that's what that means. And he's going to have to learn you. And so this is a real time of learning. You guys are learning each other, but you have to do it wisely in an environment that I'll just tell you two things you don't want to be around and then I'll stop. You don't want to be around at the beginning around negative people. So you don't want to surround yourself, especially freshly being married and stuff around negative people, period. I don't care if they're unsaved, saved, negative people, because a lot of saved people are actually the most negative people you can meet. Number two is you want to make sure anytime the door is open in the house of God, you're here all the time, as much as possible. I'm not just saying that because I'm part of the way. I'm saying that because the house of God is the safety ship. It's the ship that when the storms of life happen around us, we are in a safety ship. Your marriage right now needs direct attention, and you need to be in an environment that's conducive to the seeds God's planting in each one of your hearts, bringing you together together to help that unification take place. And if you're in the wrong environment, the seeds are not giving the chance to take root. God is saying a lot of things to both of you right now because you're learning, but you need a place you can hear clearly and not be distracted. So be here as much as possible. I think too, that's good, babe. I think too, with your children specifically, if you're not around them daily, but your prayers, your the authority that you Talk have that. in your prayers. So even almost like I'm seeing like a vision board, like you have your pictures of your children, whether it's a picture of all of you together that you put up very visibly in your home. And literally every day you guys take the time yes. to pray over each child Say their name. and speak life over them. And the word says, if you don't know what to pray, pray in the spirit. So the the Holy Spirit will speak through you the perfect will of God over their lives. And then when you need to say something to them, just ask the Holy Spirit when to fill your mouth at that moment. And and not you're not gonna nag like he's um, you were talking about the striving. It's not a nagging 
to them. It becomes this, this love and this outflow and this um, just of, of Christ's love through you when you're yeah. with them, that when they come into your home, they yeah. feel the atmosphere of the love of God. That's the point. Because you're That's in the, step and timing with the yeah. Holy Ghost. It's Galatians that 5. If we now focus. are in the Spirit, let us walk in step. It means in rhythm with the Holy Ghost daily. God bless you guys. Great. Come on. How many received from that today? Well, we're going to jump right in. How many are ready for session number three of Marriage Challenge today? We're going to learn how to communicate God's way. So let's give a big round of applause again to Gavin and Ashley Tate as we get started on session yeah. number three. Here you go, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Awesome. So today we're going to yes. be talking about communicado. Love communicate. Love communicado. So yes. it's going to be really, really good. Um, Ashley's going to go first and I'm going to go. So let's get into it today. Praise God. Amen. Well, let's just jump right in. We're going to talk about the power of our words. And let's see what God says about our words. They are very powerful. That's what communication is, right? It's opening up our mouth and using our words. In Genesis 1-3, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said it. He didn't think it or give a look at it. He didn't just wish that the earth would form or that light would come. What did he do? He spoke to it. He gave shape and form to the world with his words from the very beginning of time. And then verse 6 through 7 says, Then God said, let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. What happened. Right. That is what happened. When God says it and it takes shape, that is what happened. God needs your words. Without your words, there's nothing to create. God has no permission to get involved and bring about the healing that your relationship needs, the restoration that your relationship needs, the freedom that your children need. He needs us to open up our mouths, right, and use our words. Sometimes that's hard. I personally, that was hard for me when we first got married. I did not grow up in a family that communicated a lot. We went to church together. We... Um, we just didn't talk during the week a lot about, like my parents would ask me on the way home from church, like in, as a child, I remember like, what did you talk about in Sunday school? And then that was pretty much the extent of it. We prayed for our meals. I grew up in a godly home, but we just didn't really talk about things, really any things. So when I got married, he grew up with a lot of sisters. One of them's here today, I'm so thankful. And um, so his family, they would literally have like four hour meetings and talk about everybody's feelings and how did you think that went and what was your opinion on that? And I was like, whoa, this is a lot of talking. I don't have anything to say. Like it would get to me and I would just be like, people, would, they would ask me like, what do you think, Ashley? Or like, what are your thoughts? And I was just like, Man, I don't even know what to say. Like, you guys have already said everything that could possibly be said in this time. <laughs> but, so when we got married, and that was my, had been my experience, I didn't really realize it, honestly, until we got married. Because, of course, you know, I had girlfriends, and I was doing life with a lot of great gals, and, and so I could have conversation with them. But when you get married, that covenant that you have with your spouse unlocks a whole nother realm of intimacy and understanding and somebody who really will know your heart and know what you're thinking and, and you process with, right? That's what you're called to in that marriage dynamic is to process your life and the purpose of it with, with God and with your spouse. It's a very special communication. And so Gavin really had to help me with that. He would ask me very pointed questions and just help me get to um, bring about what I was feeling and, and, and share my emotions and share my thoughts um, 
in a way that was very helpful. And sometimes that's more, more than not, that's not the man that, that is good at that. Most of the time it's ladies that are good at asking the questions and helping. But, but if you need to focus on that in your relationship, go there. Don't shut down. It was hard for me at the beginning. I wanted to shut down because I just didn't know how to get it out. But give one another time. Don't belittle those questions, husband, when, they're, when your wife is questioning you about something. Don't just say, never mind, I don't wanna talk about it, I don't wanna talk about work, I don't wanna talk about the family. No, you need, to, you need to give your wife that time. She deserves it and you deserve it because that's the unity in your marriage. So much of our words and our communication is, a, is about finding that unity, right? It starts with our words. So if God used words to create and bring life, that is what we're gonna do with our words. We're gonna use our words to give life, to build, to encourage. Without words, there's nothing for God to get involved with. So men, I need you to Look at your wives and tell them, not in this moment, but I'm just saying, when you leave from here, look at them and tell them how much you love them. Sometimes when Gavin's leaving in the morning, he'll just say, okay, bye, babe, have a good day. And I'm like, wait, 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 come back. I wanna look you in the eyes and I wanna say, I love you. I'm, let me pray over you, right? Our husbands need to hear that. Thank you for what you're doing for this family. Thank you for how you lead. Thank you for being an intentional dad whether that's the reality or not, right? Don't wait, don't hold back your words because unless we say it and speak it out, guess what, that's faith. That's what faith does. Faith takes, the, the, the words take shape, right? Some of you might be waiting and holding your words back until you see it, right? Show me the money. We don't get to say that to our spouse. We are the ones that God says, it's, I'm gonna use your words. When you're building your spouse up, when you're encouraging them, when you're saying, you've got this, you can do this, this is, you're an awesome dad. Even if you don't feel like they are in the moment, you're saying, I give you permission to do that. And God says, okay, I can take that word of encouragement and I can get involved and I can help transform you. That's what the word of God does. It transforms us. We're not responsible to change our spouse. That's, we know that's God's job, right? But it is our job to use our words to build up. Our words only do one of two things. They build or they tear down. There's no neutral zone. There's no middle ground with words. They don't fall in some gray area. They either build and bring about life and goodness and the goodness of God, or they tear down. Ladies, we cannot tear down with our words. Yes, we can find all of the realities of a situation and vent and put it out there, but that's not God's way. That's not God's way. Um, we need to encourage, we need to say, you are the man for the job, and husbands, you need to tell us we're the, we're the best uh, moms to our children, right? We need to hear that. We want to hear that. I want to talk about a story in the Word um, where we can see clearly the power of our words. This is Numbers 13. Moses sends out the 12 uh, different leaders of the tribes of Israel to scout out the promised land. He says, I want you to go to Canaan, and I want you to take inventory, and let's see what kind of strategy we're gonna need to take over that land, because that's where I'm sending you. So what happens? The men go out and they see the reality of the land. They see that there's giants, that things are already very developed, and they come back and they're nervous. It says, 10 came back speaking negatively and caused the people to murmur about the land. That word murmur means to be obstinate especially in words, to complain. There, are power, there is power in your words. When we complain about the situations, when we complain about our children or about our finances, or when we just complain to one another about your behavior, 
Let's not let it, it can't stop there. Yes, there are things we have to talk about. We have to talk about finances. We have to talk about our kids and where our lives are going and the direction of things. And there's a lot of things to take care of in the natural realm, but don't let it stop there. Take that same amount of time that you just spent talking about the reality or more and find out what God says in the word about those realities because we have to make the word personal. If you just look at the word as some manual that some, you know, the people wrote thousands of years ago that's just, oh, the whole world, you, you can just take this and this is very vague. No, the word is personal. And when you take the time to find the personal way that God wants to address your situation or your circumstance or your relationship, then the Holy Spirit can reveal it to you. All right, so what happened? The, back to the 10 guys. So they came back complaining and murmuring, and so it just caught like wildfire. It went all through the tribes of Israel. Everybody's complaining. They're saying, it would have been better for us to stay in Egypt. We should just go back. We had better food. We had more care than we do here in the wilderness, right? But guess what happened when all of that went about? It caused a 40-year delay. Their negativity meant for 40 more years, they would be in the wilderness instead of going into the promised land. God wants to bring your relationship into a promised land. You have places that you need to go and things that you need to accomplish. Do you have negative words that you're speaking over your spouse or over yourself, single people? Are you causing a delay on your own situation, on your own relationship? Because God cannot get involved with negativity. You're either building up and transforming and allowing God to bring change or you're tearing down. And do you know what happens on this side of the spectrum? The enemy gets involved. You give the enemy permission to be in your relationship and, and, and cause strife and tension and disunity, but we don't want that, right? We, ha we are here for Jesus. Who wants more of Jesus in their relationship today? Amen. We are here for more of Jesus in our relationships. So we're gonna be like the two men that came back and they were pumped. They were full of faith, right? Joshua and Caleb, they're like, but we can take those giants. We've got this, babe, we can do this. Things might be difficult right now, but as, if we declare the word of God over every single thing in our family, if we take the time to make a culture of the word being the answer, the word being our joy, the word being our peace, the word being our rock, then anything can try to come against us and it will not stand in Jesus' name. All right, amen, amen. All right, so we are responsible. The word says in Matthew 12, 36, you are responsible for the words that you speak. Everyone will give an account yes. for idle words. So when we are at the, in, the, um, in heaven and we're being um, asked by the judgment Lord, seat. the judgment seat, thank you, we will give an account for any idle word. Idle means barren and lifeless. We don't wanna be responsible for those words, do we? We want to take our, use our marriages and, and not use them, but we want to take the time in our relationships, in our covenant with our spouse, to, to exhort, to encourage, to prophesy, especially when somebody's down, when there's something that's going on, right? We wanna be the one. God sent us as their spouse to encourage, not to beat them down, not to trample on them with our words and tear them apart, but to bring them life, to bring them hope. Babe, God's got us. We're gonna be okay. We're gonna walk through this together. You're allies, you're not enemies. You are an ally with your spouse. You're doing it together, walking hand in hand. All right, I'm gonna read in closing my favorite, one of my favorite verses, it's Isaiah 55. 10 through 13, and it says, my word is like the snow and the rain that comes down from the sky to water the earth. 
They make the crops grow and provide seed for planting and food to eat. So also will be the word that I speak. It will not fail to do what I plan for it. It will do everything I send it to do. So when you speak the word of God over your spouse, over your circumstances, over your children, over the things that are going on in your relationship, when you speak the word of God, it goes forth and it accomplishes what God sent it to do. Man, we can have faith in that, right? When God says, I'm gonna do it, when you say it, when you open your mouth and speak it out, I'm gonna make sure that it happens. That is good news today, guys. Amen. Thank you, Lord. It goes on and it says, you will leave Babylon with joy. You will be led out of the city in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into singing and the trees will shout for joy. Cypress trees will grow where now there are briars. Myrtle trees will come up in place of thorns. This will be a sign that will last forever, a reminder of what I, the Lord, have done. So if there are briars in your relationship, if there are thorns, if there are things that you don't wanna be there, open up your mouth and begin to declare the word of God. Communicate your love, right? Use your words to build one another up, to love one another, to encourage one another. And God will make sure that his goodness and blessing are part of healing and bringing restoration in Jesus name. The Bible says in Genesis 2, 19 through 20, 23 through 25, it says that the Lord God formed from the ground the wild animals and the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man who was already created to see what he would name them. And the man chose a name for each one, but still there was no helper. And the man exclaimed, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh when God formed the woman. What is going on here? Your words have the power that God created man and he puts him in a garden and he gives him a job. He gives him a job. He says, I want you to work the garden. Somebody say work. Work is not a product of the curse. Work is before sin ever entered in, we were supposed to work it. We were supposed to be planting something, tending something, moving something, creating something. Your words are either working against God or they're working for his plan for your marriage right now. There is no middle ground with words, as my wife has said. We're either building up or we are tearing down. So God says, I got you a job. Whatever you name any of these things, that's the identity it's going to become. Listen, he brings the animals to him to see what he will name them. Can't God name them himself? Of course. But he doesn't want to have to say it all. He wants to partner with us and he wants to affirm your words. So watch this. He's not, he could do it all himself. He could have said, that's a giraffe, that's a lion, that's a whale, whatever. But he didn't, he was more interested in the partnership with you than he is doing it all himself. You see, God is not interested in just making your marriage great. He's interested in partnering with your words to make it great. He's interested with partnering with your attitude to believe what he's already said so that he can make it great. You see, think about this. What does God get from you getting a breakthrough? God gets nothing out of that. He doesn't need a breakthrough. You ever thought about that? What does God get from you preaching the word? Does God need to hear the word? Does he need to be taught something? The thing that God gets from prayer, what does God get from prayer? He gets you. It's about being with you. He wants you in the relationship with you in the journey. He wants you to say it from your mouth so he gets time with you. That's why he loves it when you have to come back and pray. That's why he only gives you enough for one day. He doesn't give you enough from his presence for all week. He gives you enough, but you're gonna have to seek him again tomorrow. And you're gonna have to seek him again the next day. And the next day, why? Because God is jealous for you. He wants your time. The only thing God gets out of this is you. 
So God is not trying to do something apart from your marriage. He's not trying to sit back in heaven and you just wait for something to go on. I guarantee you nothing will shift until you get on God's language. You have to speak his language. Genesis 11, this is so powerful. And, and uh, it says the Tower of Babel is happening. And all these people are getting together to build this huge tower to make a monument basically to themselves. It said a couple key things. One, they all spoke the same language. There were no different languages at this time. And they were all unified. Now, listen what God himself says. He's in heaven with all of his angels. He's at the round table. And they're all speaking. And he's like, y'all got to see what's going on down here. He's talking to heaven. And he says, listen to this. Genesis eleven six. Look, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this... Nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. So this is a bad thing they're doing, but even God is recognizing when people get in the same language and united on the same thing, nothing can stop them. So he said, what are we going to do? He said, we got to mix up their languages. Listen, he said, if we get them to not understand each other, then they won't be able to build anything. Do you know that it's possible? You could be speaking the same English language or the same Spanish language, but still two different languages. Do you know it's possible you could both be speaking the same native language you were born with, but you're still not speaking the language of God, so you're still disunified? Do you know that it's possible that you could be literally tearing down the promises and plans of God for you just from the fact that even though you speak the same language, you are not repeating God's. The moment you stop speaking the same language, what happened? They stopped building. When you come off of the right language, you're not speaking God's language, you as a wife aren't speaking it, or you as a husband, and you begin to speak your own opinions, your own feelings, your own thoughts, you no longer are building anything. You are pitting park, and you're stopped. Your language, your your marriage could be in park for 20 years. You know what happens while you're in park? Many people think nothing's moving. But I want you to understand, a lot is moving even though you think you're not moving. Watch, this is what happens. You're in park, nothing's happened in your marriage, there's no excitement anymore, there's no love, there's no unity, you're not accomplishing anything in your marriage. So what begins to happen? You're in the same house, but you become strangers. Some people will even sleep in different bedrooms, yet they'll live in the same house. You know why? Because divorce, no, 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 we don't want to do that. We're allergic to the word divorce in Christianity, but we'll live like we're divorced just in the same house. (laughs) You know that it's possible to still live together, but become strangers? Do you know it's possible that you could just do your life and she could just do her life even though you made a covenant? All it is, is just a few conversations that are outside of the line of God away. Have a few conversations where you tear her to pieces with your mouth and watch what happens to how she treats you. Have a couple conversations to where a woman, you literally, literally chop him into pieces with your mouth by destroying his identity, destroying who he is. Tell him how lazy he is, how all the things he does are terrible, how he doesn't care, how he's thoughtless, and watch him climb into a cave and never want to talk to you again. Or we could get on God's language. Do you understand that when we begin to speak the same language, Nothing is impossible for what we set out to do as a married couple. The Bible says this an incredible story, Luke 1 20. And right before I say that, let me go back to Adam. He's there naming the animals and what happens? God puts him to sleep. Mary, uh, single people, you need to understand this. Quick side note. The greatest way to be single and what are you supposed to be doing in your singleness to prepare for your spouse? Let me just give you the best advice you'll ever hear. It comes from the Bible, so I didn't make it up. I can't take credit for it, but it's really good. The Bible says that he was put to sleep. While he was asleep, God is doing what? Surgery on him to bring out something that was about to create the greatest thing he could have never prayed for. He wouldn't have even known how to write a list for. He wouldn't have known how to do it all. Why did God have to have him to sleep? Because he actually knew what the man wanted more than the man knew what he wanted. 
He knew what the man needed more than the man knew what he needed. So he had to make sure the man was asleep so he could have no say in ruining what God was going to bring. You see, this is what singleness is all about. Singleness is about you getting on the gurney and letting God operate on you. It's about letting him take out of you something, letting him put into you something. It's not about getting on Tinder. It's not about getting on dating websites. It's not about trying to find it. It's not about being in the midst of all the fish because if I'm not around the fish, then I'll never have one. I'll never catch anything if I'm not in the dating scene right now. No, no, no. You're supposed to be in the operating room. What are you doing out here? That's singleness. God knows what you want more than you know what you want. You don't even know what you want. You think you know what you want. But here's the thing. You might think you know what you want, but you don't know what you need. I had no idea I was going to marry a woman who had no mercy. <laughs> you know the gift test? Has anybody ever done a gift test? You know those Christian things we do in church, you know, gift test? There's one next week. Hey, it's awesome. Next week, we're going to be taking a gift test. So it lists like, you know, oh, the prophet, you're more of a teacher, administrative gift, leadership gift, all that kind of stuff. Well, there's mercy on there. You know, hers is like 3% mercy. She has no mercy. And I'm like, I am privy to that fact. She has no mercy. My God. And, but she's gotten better and all that. But, let me, but I needed a woman who wouldn't give me no chances. I needed a woman who wasn't going to give me mercy when I was doing something stupid. Some of y'all... God knows exactly the mixture of the person who is perfect for your destiny, but you're too busy writing your own lists that he can't put his in your life. Anyway, let's go back to the word. So Luke 1 says this. This is so incredible. It says that Zechariah is in the temple. And it says that the angel of the Lord comes to Zechariah and says something incredible. He says, you are going to have a son. His name's going to be John. He's going to prepare the way for the Savior of the world. He's going to get baptized in the Holy Ghost before he's even born, while he's still in the womb, Kurt, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he said, it's going to be amazing. And how does Zechariah respond? Uh, you sure you got this right? We're pretty old. Me and my wife, how is this going to happen? We're pretty along in years. Did you forget that? And he says, I have literally come out of the throne of God. My name is Gabriel. I am the angel of the Lord. And look at what he says right here. Luke 1 20. Because you did not believe what I said, you will now be silent and unable to speak until the promise comes to pass. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at a proper time. What is he saying? He's saying, if I let you keep speaking the way you're speaking right now, you're going to abort the promise. So I'm literally going to physically shut your mouth down until the promise comes to pass. Because Zechariah, you don't understand how powerful your words are. So I'm going to go ahead and get involved this time. Because if John the Baptist doesn't happen, then he won't prepare the way for this other child who's yet to be born, whose name is Jesus, who's going to come and fill the shoes of nobody else could fill. So Zechariah, I know you've doubted things before, but I'm not going to let you mess this one up. Be quiet. Do you know when you're about to say something to your spouse and it makes sense because they deserve what you're about to say? You know what I'm talking about. That situation happens and it happens again and you're sitting there, oh, yeah, yeah. You're about to give it to them, right? Because they deserve it. Because you're right. Because it actually does make sense. However, the Holy Ghost will come in and he'll say, you're actually not going to say that at all. Actually, I want you to be quiet. Who are you telling me to be quiet? I thought I was the Lord of your life. My name is the Holy Ghost. You told me I was the boss on Sunday. You told me I was the boss on Wednesday. You told me I was the boss at DG. Now I'm trying to be the boss. Are you going to let me? Because I promise you, with your spouse, you're going to be put to the test daily. And you know what's going to happen? You're either going to obey, and you're going to be quiet, or you're going to say something that might tear your spouse to pieces that could take months, if not years, to recover. God wants to get a hold of your mouth because it doesn't belong to you. 
Don't you remember that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Why are you acting with your mouth like it's something you own? That mouth was not meant to be owned by you. That mouth was meant to be used by God. Don't you know that your mouth is so special? How, when's the last time you remembered how your mouth is actually disconnected from your feelings? Did you know that? Did you know, how could your mouth not be disconnected? Psalm 42, David's there. He wakes up, his feelings are depressed, but his mouth is disconnected from his feelings. So his mouth can turn and talk to his feelings and say, get in the will of God. You will praise God. I know you're depressed right now. I know you're feeling down. Why? Because the mouth is disconnected from the feelings. Don't you understand that the same mouth that formed the waters and the birds and said, let it be, he put on you? Paul says, speak as if speaking the exact oracles of God. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm giving you my mouth. That's why there's power of life and death in it. That's why you can look at a bunch of dry bones and say, get up and start praising God. That's why you can look at your wife who is depressed and hopeless and say, babe, I believe in you. You're amazing. I know you keep falling down, but I just want you to know we're going to make it together, babe. You and I are going to do this. That's why you can use your mouth, ladies, and look at your husband. And you know he already feels depressed. You know he already feels lazy. You know he already feels like he's missing out on everything in life and he hasn't fulfilled his potential can't you see it if you know him you can see it what are you gonna do about it are you gonna call him what his feelings are already telling him he is matter of fact what the devil's already telling him he is or are you gonna get on the other side and say babe I just want you to know you're a man mm, you're a handsome man of God I just want you to know you got something I just want you to know I know that you're working things out right now but I just want you to know I'm with you in the battle matter of fact I'm gonna pray for you baby because I know what God showed me you are I've seen it and it's gonna happen when's the last time Come on, babe. Come on up here. We're out of time. Chris, if you come out here, play a little bit. Little doodly do. <laughs> Every person, close your eyes. This is a time of self-examination. Have your words been used to bring life? Or are you in a cycle right now? If you had to be honest and say, Gavin, we're in a cycle of fighting. We're in a cycle of arguing. I don't know the last time, Gavin, that we had a conversation that I felt peace by the end of it or I felt joy. I don't know the last time I was encouraged. I don't know the last time I encouraged him or her. I want you to know God's not angry with you. But it is time to get back on the same language. It's time to build again. That's a word for somebody you need to hear. It's time for your marriage to start building again. Because as much as we might feel like we're dropping things and that we've messed up in our marriage, we've said too many harsh things. I understand wherever you're coming from. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks right now. You don't even know. You came to this uh, meeting because you're like, hey, this is our last resort. I just want you to understand something. God has never left you or forsaken you because he's still there. Anything is possible. He just wants you to start speaking the same language. As Ashley said this morning, he's waiting for you to say something before you see something. We don't wait till we see a change in our spouse to call him what we know God says they are. We don't wait to see a change and then have to be perfect and better before we can say what we know God already says they are. When we speak, we give God something to fulfill. We give him something to work with. And as you're examining yourself, I want you just right now to repent between you and God. If you say either one, I've been using my mouth to tear down and not build up. Or number two, I've been withholding words because I'm waiting to see performance. And I understand it's important. It is important that we actually do what we say. It is important that we perform. God will help us to do that. However, you cannot wait to speak before you see. You have to speak first. Every couple, if you'd stand to your feet now, stand to your feet now, every couple, married couple in this place, we're just gonna ask for one moment here. Turn to your spouse. 
Right now, just turn to your spouse. Go ahead, babe. Why don't you come back? Just repent to them if you need to for any words that you've spoken negatively over them or if there's a confession that you keep making to one another that's maybe a habit or just a recent conversation that you've had. Just ask them to forgive you and then forgive. Receive that forgiveness. Yes. This isn't the time to hold anything back. This is the time to say, I forgive you. Let God help you. It's okay. And then begin to encourage them. Give them some, some life with your words. Whatever it was that you were speaking ill about, speak life over that situation or over them. Do you know God's will? Do you know his will for that situation? Do you know what his word says about it? If you don't, don't worry about it. Today, you can find that out when That's you get right. home. When you get home, you can find out what God's word says about your exact situation. I promise. Yeah. There is an answer in the Bible for you to agree on. Sometimes you don't have the words to say. Sometimes you don't have exactly what the answers are. But that's what's so great about the word of God. It's our greatest marriage manual. It will give you something to agree on. It will give you the words to put into your mouth. You don't even have to make up your own. How great is that? God will literally give you the thing to say and to believe for. And I believe he's going to do it for couples in here today. Amen. Babe, go ahead and pray for us today. God, thank you for your word. You gave it to us. You said it's better, Jesus, that I, you go away, that the Holy Spirit would come and would fill us. And we know, Holy Spirit, that you are our counselor, that you are the one that helps us to understand the word, that the word is sharper than a two-edged sword, which means that it can help us understand and to navigate this life and this relationship together. So Lord, I thank you that as people go home, that as they take the time this week to talk about words, to understand your word and what it, how it's applying to them right now in the situations. Would you bring healing, God? Would you bring yes. restoration? Yes. Would you bring life where there has been no life before, Lord? I thank you that you're doing a miracle in hearts right now, that you're unlocking tongues, that you're unlocking words right now, that words would begin to flow where they have not thank flown you, in the past that your word would come in, that it would transform and, and restore yes. and bring life in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, God, that your word says that you send it out, that it will go forth and it will produce a great harvest yes. in their lives in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for love. We receive your love for us and we love our spouses. We are committed to this, to use our words to bring life in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody look up at me who's here right now. Every couple look up at me. We're going to give you one of the greatest, small, it's only one, piece of advice that it changed the way we can talk about hard things. Not every single thing that we talk about is just easy to talk about. There are some hard issues and maybe issues where you come from opposite spectrums, like in total disagreement. Disagreement is totally fine, but arguing or wanting to be right is not fine. It's about finding unity. It's okay if we disagree. That's healthy. You, the fact that you are who you are and she is who she is and that you're different is one of the reasons God brought you together because you'll be able to see another angle that you never would have been able to without them. However, it is important that we fight for unity, not fighting for somebody to be right. So here's the greatest piece of advice we can give you. There are many communication tactics we could say, but this one has changed our life. Talk prayerfully. What does that mean? Well, when we were married for the first five years, we really didn't argue about too much at all, but we hadn't, didn't have kids yet. So we didn't argue about pretty yeah. much anything. So we knew we were going to wait five years before we wanted to try to get pregnant. So we're trying to get pregnant. It almost took about two years before we had Max. But when we had our son, all of a sudden there was a different side of us that we'd never saw. So she'd never seen me as a dad and I'd never seen her as a mom. And we were exact opposite parenting styles. Do you know there's a parenting style? It's, it's actually people have them. And uh, come to find out, ours were not alike in any way. And so we were having these arguments, I mean, full-on, drag-out, intense, you know, heated fellowship, you could call it, um, <laughs> about 
uh, you know, our son. It was about nothing else. It was always just about our son and what we were doing and the bedtimes and the feeding and how we're raising him and all that stuff. And, uh, and it was really tough. How would you describe that time, babe? Yeah, it felt very discouraging because here we were like just trying to navigate. I've never been a mom before. I'm trying to figure that out. He's never been a dad before trying to figure that out. And it's, and so it was very difficult. We would have very, like he said, heated disagreements and just like felt like we couldn't get to a conclusion. And I just felt very discouraged and was like, man, we got to figure this out. Like, God, there has to be a better way. Would you really help us? So what God did is about, it was about a year and a half in, uh, just under a year and a half. And we'd been having, you know, just, we had another one of these arguments and I said, okay, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. You know, we'll come back. I got to take Max to the park. I just had to get out and breathe. So I'm, I'm there pushing him, you know, on the swing. And the Holy Spirit asked me a question. And how many you know he doesn't ask a question because he needs an answer? He asks a question because he wants you to know the answer. And so he asks, he says, um, do you know that I'm in the room when you speak to each other? And I said, yeah. He said, do you? Because you wouldn't speak that way if you knew that I was among you. And I just remember saying, Lord, I'm so sorry. And I'm repenting and doing this whole thing. And then he says, let me give you a tool. He said, I want you to talk prayerfully. And I said, God, how does that work? I said, you're going to have to show me. He said, this is what's going to happen. He literally took me through it. And he said, what you're going to do is you're going to sit down together. Number one is you're going to invite me and realize that I'm among you. So we, we would do that. When we approach a hard conversation, we'd first just take 30 seconds. Yeah. We'd begin to just say, Holy Spirit, we know that you're here among us. Yeah. We know that you're about to hear what we're going to say. This is going to be hard for us, Lord, yeah. and we're going to need your help, right? It was literally like a counseling session. We would sit down like, with a great counselor We would himself. make sure it was after Max had already gone to sleep. You so cannot could, do this when your kids are awake. We could have no distractions. And, <laughs> yeah, that would be even worse. And so we would sit down, and it was like, okay, we're calling this meeting. Holy Spirit, like even if you... He became the counselor. He sat yes. right there. I remember our ottoman, literally our footrest. He called it an ottoman, pretty fancy word. Ottoman <laughs> right there. Yes. And I was like, he's sitting right there. Like I felt it. I was like, he's there. He's about to counsel us. We're going go to go into a session. And just to set it up like that, it already feels like there's a reverence to that moment. Yes. You know, like it's not just us like hashing something out and feeling like we can just say whatever we want. Like he said, the Holy Spirit is now here. And we're, we want to be careful how we're addressing God's son. Yep. So there were only two ground rules. Number one, we would never interrupt each other. Yeah. That was a tough one. Practical. Practical. It was a tough one. But you cannot interrupt the other person until they're done speaking. This was tough. Number two, before we speak, we were going to make sure what we were going to be saying was only something we knew the Holy Spirit was okay with us saying. Now, I know this takes intentional. This is intentionality. I prom if you're in a habit and you've argued for so long, this might be tough for you. Be like, oh, we've been married 40 years. He's fine. She's fine. Yeah, like it might even seem That's kind, not of, okay. kind of silly. That, that is literally settling for way less than God wanted to give you. It's not too late now. And I want to tell people, I don't care how long you've been married. It's not too late to really get the main purpose God had for you before you were married. God got you married together. God wanted that spouse for you yeah. because there was something you could do together you could have never done single. You want to accomplish that. You want that to be happening. So we would sit there and we would say, okay, you go first. So Ashley would say the whatever subject, it was always about Max, about something that we were doing. And I automatically, I'd feel the anger and the stuff start coming up. Like, are we really about to talk about this again? You still haven't gotten the point of this, blah, blah, blah. but I didn't say it. And then I would take it to the Lord and be like, Holy Spirit. And, and he literally, it would be like he examined all the words I was about to say, and then he'd start deleting them. So he'd say, okay, you're not going to say that line. Nope, nope, nope. And by the end of it, I had nothing to say. So I'd be like, well, what do I say? The Holy Spirit's like, nothing. You're going to listen. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I would just listen. And then when it was my, he says, you can say this. And I'm telling you, it was such an attentiveness. It's so powerful. If you take this, I promise it will change you. It was such an attentiveness to the presence of God in the room with us that it probably took us about eight months. I'd say eight solid months of, of intentional practice, but it got easier the entire time. And it became very natural. And it's very natural. We don't even think about it now. We do it now just on that. But, it, but I'm telling you, it was only a year and a half of doing the habits. It took eight months to relearn it. You might have 20 or 30 years of these habits. So I'm not saying it's going to take 10 years, but I am saying that it's going to take intentionality. 
It's going to take actually being willing to you both paying the price to do it, especially if one of you have already written off your spouse that he will never listen. It's mostly he will never listen. He will never or she will never. And so I don't want to talk about this because I don't want to waste the energy. You're going to have to get out of that conversation. You're going to have to never say that again because what you just said is that she's not worth the energy. He's not worth the energy. And you understand that is first, before she's your wife, she's a daughter of God. And you just said that a daughter of yours is not worth my time. Very intense. So please understand, you're gonna have to open back up to this again. We're gonna have to go for what God's will is and it's gonna have to be intentional. Yeah, and patience too. Lots of yeah. patience But God will, God will show you. So that's yeah. the key we wanted to give you guys. Can you give a hand clap today for God's word, God's will? Be seated, please. We're about to dismiss, just be seated. Everybody, please close your eyes. It's a holy moment. Right now, if you say, and we've listened to the sermon, Gavin, I've been thinking about Jesus this entire time, but I do not know him. I'm not sure I have peace with God. You cannot buy peace with God with money. You can't buy peace with God with the right friends. There's only one way to peace with God. It's through his son, Jesus Christ, making a decision for him to take over your life. If you say, that's me, and you say, number one, I've never received him, but I want to do it today. Or number two, I have received him, but I haven't been serious. I want to recommit my life to the Lord. And I want this marriage myself, whether I'm single or married, to be fully committed to discipleship. One, two, three. Lift your hand in the air right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Boldly all over the building. Thank you. Thank you. I see you in the back. I see all these people all over the back. I see them all over. Come on. Thank you. Give my hand. Give my hand. I'm seeing you all the way back there. I'm seeing you there. I'm seeing you there. My gosh, look at all these hands. Now, please stand up where you're at. If you raised your hand, stand up. If you raised your hand, only those who raised their hand, please stand up. Thank you. Give my hand one more time. Guys, they're doing this. This isn't easy. They're being bold about this. Thank you. Thank you so much for making a decision for Jesus. Now, listen, we have a team up here who's about to pray with you, but I promise they're not, we're not gonna ask you any question. I'm not gonna get you on the microphone or nothing. But what I wanna do is if you would just take this last step, you've already been here, you might as well take one last step. Walk up to the front with us right now, please. Come up to the front, come up to the front. Give them a hand. Look at these people coming. Hey. Right here, guys, right here, right here's a couple right here, thank you. Thank you, right here, right here. Altar teams, help them get with somebody, please. Come on, keep coming. Give my hand. They're still coming. Altar workers, if we need some more, we got some more right here in the center who can have some people. Make sure they're here. Look at all these people still coming. Look at them coming right here. Come on, we got families. We got an entire family. We got a whole family getting saved today. My gosh. Wow. We got mother, father, and son, and daughter right over here getting saved. Come on, people. Come on, church. Congratulate them. Every person as they're moving, every person say this prayer with me right before we dismiss. Every person say this prayer. What's going to happen is after we pray this congregational prayer together, they're going to be asking you, making sure you have a gift that we want to give you, and they're going to be praying with you as well. Guys, as you come up right here, I want you to understand two things. Number one. All of your sins are about to be completely wiped away and forgiven by the blood of Jesus. God will never remember them anymore. Even though he could remember them, he chooses never to bring them up again. And number two, you're going to have to forgive yourself. You're going to have to forgive yourself. So close your eyes right now. Let's pray this prayer together. And right after we pray it, I want you to ask God to help you to forgive yourself. Every person in the building say this, dear Jesus. I need you. I love you. Thank you for loving me. I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the dead and you did it so you could wipe away my sins. Thank you for your blood that cleanses me. Thank you for your blood that makes me new. I will never be the same. I want to be a disciple. I'm no longer the boss of my own life. You're now the boss. Tell me what to do. Tell me the friends to have. Tell me where to go. Jesus, thank you. I'm no longer guilty. I'm no longer guilty. I'm going to heaven. I have peace with you now. 
I receive it. Amen. Come on, give him a hand. Every person who's up here right now, the altar team is going to be praying with you and asking you some questions. Make sure you take time. Thank you all. We'll be having service on Wednesday night. Pastor Marco is continuing his leadership series. We love you. Please do the Marriage Growth Book together. Don't skip any steps. It's all worth it. You're worth it to God. Make sure you're worth it to each other. God bless you.